Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. My name is Megan Robertson, and I'm the Associate Curator of Interpretation here at the Frist Center. Thank you for joining us this evening for a very special lecture, Stylish Cities, Fashion and a Sense of Place from Milan to Nashville, presented by Karen Elson and Libby Calloway. This program is in support of our exhibition, Italian Style, Fashion Since 1945. If you have yet to visit the galleries, I heartily encourage you to do so as soon as possible. The exhibition will close, well not quite as soon, at the end of tonight's program rather. Um, the exhibition will close on September 7th. And our galleries are open until 9 p.m. this evening, so you'll have plenty of time um, after learning about uh, fashion capitals to go and take a look. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers to you this evening. Libby Calloway has contributed to some of the country's most widely regarded magazines and newspapers, including the New York Post, where she was employed as a writer and editor from 1997 to 2004. As a freelance fashion and style writer, she has penned stories for publications and websites, including Elle, The New York Times Magazine, Style.com, Travel and Leisure, and Glamour, where she was a fashion advice columnist from 2005 to 2006. As a creative consultant with a concentration in media relations, Libby has worked with a local and regional client base, including the Frist Center for the Visual Arts, thank you Libby, fashion and design companies Electra Eggleston, Otis James, Alabama Channon, em Emile Irwin, and Amanda Valentine, as well as the 404 Hotel and Kitchen. She is the former media director for Nashville denim company Imogene and Willie, and marketing director for the Alabama fashion house Billy Reed. In 2013, with art dealer Susan Sherrick, Libby co-founded Joint, a series of pop-up happenings in Nashville that combine art, food, fashion, and music. She makes frequent public appearances as a speaker and moderates panels on the subjects of style and the fashion industry. Karen Elson is a British supermodel, musician, and songwriter. Karen has graced the covers and editorials of the top fashion magazines, including British Vogue, W Magazine, Harper's Bazaar, Elle, Marie Claire, and Italian Vogue. She's also been the face of Yves Saint Laurent, Chanel, Tiffany, and Dior, along with a host of Italian fashion houses, including Armani, Prada, and Versace, in fashion campaigns and on the runway. Karen is considered a fashion industry icon, well respected for her work ethic and versatility in front of the camera. She's won the VH1 Model of the Year Award and was named British Model of the Year by the British Fashion Council. She's also, of course, a singer, songwriter, and performer, and has been a creative director for the New York City-based cabaret troupe, The Citizens Band, for over 10 years. She's also recorded with Beck, Cat Power, and Robert Plant, in addition to releasing her own self-written al albums to great acclaim. In 2014, it was announced that Karen was named as an advancer, excuse me, an ambassador for Save the Children UK. Karen also has an emerging philanthropic venture, Vintage Vanguard, with filmmaker Liz Goldwyn. Vintage Vanguard has power, partnered with Vogue and the charity Dress for Success to use fashion as an empowering tool for women. We would like to thank Libby and Karen for their incredible support of the Frist Center. We're so grateful to have two fashion insiders in our corner. In addition to providing a wonderful um, peek behind the curtain of the fashion industry tonight, both have been tremendous advocates for the exhibition in the community. Thank you both for donating your time and your talents to the Frist Center. We'd also like to thank the Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their ongoing operating support of this museum. Thank you again, Karen and Libby, for this evening's lecture. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Sound okay? Wait, 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 I don't. Let me... If you can't hear me, I'll just talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, some of you might have been here five years ago, and I can't believe it was five years ago, when Karen and I first sat on this stage to talk about fashion around the time of the golden age of couture show. 
Um, and I think I speak for us both when I say that it's really a pleasure to be back here. It's something we both really enjoyed. Absolutely. And we're going to do it every five years. <laughs> Maybe and more. And occasionally if you'll have, at my kids' school. Occasionally Maybe at her kids' school. At USN, yeah, there you go. At USN. We did it recently at USN. Can you guys hear me properly? Okay, that's good. So, yeah, I hope everybody has seen Italian style. It's really a pretty phenomenal exhibit. I've um, been a couple of times, and each time I leave dazzled by a different outfit. Right. It's pretty great. So tonight we're going to be talking about stylish cities, which is a really big topic. It's much bigger than we have time to cover in one hour. So we decided to focus on four cities, which are um, international fashion capitals, New York, London, Milan, and Paris. And each of these cities has a major fashion week, which is definitely part of the reason we want to talk about them. Um, but we do think it's important to point out that having fashion shows isn't enough for a city to call itself a fashion capital. New York, London, Milan, and Paris are, fashion, are not fashion capitals because they have fashion weeks. They have fashion weeks because they are fashion capitals, mm -hmm. which means they have the business infrastructure, the manufacturing and production facilities, the PR, you know, the PR agencies and the showrooms, and, all, and most importantly, the skilled workforce that's needed to build a billion-dollar industry. Mm -hmm. So Karen and I are both on the board of the Nashville Fashion Alliance, yes, and the NFA is working hard in its first year to set the groundwork for the creation of a local workforce that can help build a viable fashion ecosystem here. And it's my hope that in 20 years, maybe you and I will be back, or maybe Scarlett, her daughter, will be back doing this same imagine? kind of conversation, <laughs> talking, talk, talking, about, talking about Nashville as an um, international fashion capital. So. Um, Here's, okay, here's the deal. With our four fashion capitals, twice a year in February, if we're talking about women's ready-to-wear, which is what we're going to concentrate on tonight because that's Karen's forte, in February and September, the international press and buyers descend on these four cities and enjoy the fashion shows that are put on. They enjoy them, but they're also there for work because what they're doing is they're finding out what they're going to be writing about and featuring in their magazines mm -hmm. and selling in their stores that next season. It's like a glamorous way of going on tour. Exactly. Basically. You're gone for a month or I'm gone for a month or so. Yeah. In all these various cities with every, you know. And it sounds, it sounds glamorous, but I know it's exhausting. It's really hard work. But it's a lot of hard work. It is but definitely a little bit. Yeah, nice it's a little, bit, road, a little yeah. bit. A little bit. A little bit testing. Yeah. But, um, you know, and as fashion followers, we're finding out what's happening at the shows by reading newspapers and following blogs and watching social media now, but we're never really getting the full story. The only way you can get the full story is to talk to an insider. Thus, we have Karen up here. I mean <laughs> Um, but yes, so talking to an insider is the best way to find out really what is happening. And we're very lucky that Karen is here to share almost two decades of work experience. Isn't that crazy? I know, it's so God. awesome. <laughs> so here's how the next hour is going to work. Um, Karen has very thoughtfully chosen images from key runway shows, ad campaigns, editorials, and red carpets from throughout her career that are associated with each of our four fashion capitals. And they're going to provide a jumping off point for us to talk about each of these cities' unique attributes with Karen Wang and specifically about some of her behind the scenes experience in each market. And we're going to wrap by discussing Nashville's burgeoning fashion scene, and then we're going to take your questions. So I think we should just jump right in. I I'm think going to so. take a swig of water. <laughs> this is a little bit of cotton mouth. But let's, okay, so let's start talking about New York. What do you think of when you think of New York fashion? Which, of course, New York stands in for the United States, I feel like. Well, um, first of all, this image, actually, I was um, six, seven months pregnant with Scarlett, actually, with my first child. Who's going to be up here in 20 years' time. <laughs> Who's now nine years old, yeah. so that's how long ago that image was. And this is um, Mark Jacobs, the designer Mark Jacobs, asked me, he sent me a text message and said, would you mind walking in my runway show pregnant? And I was like, sure, that sounds... Because most designers want the opposite. They want the they opposite, want exactly, stomach. there you go. So I was like, absolutely, I'd love to do, I'd love to do that. So there you go, that just has such sentimental, such a sentimental image. You can't even tell I'm pregnant, really, but I was, you know, you see me from the front, from the side, it was a whole other story. But I don't think it's so sweet. <laughs> I was like a giant Easter egg, basically, just a <laughs> massive egg. Um, so New York means to me, um, New York fashion at least, New York is, it's big business, it's commercial fashion and creativity, it's the mix of all those things and Mark Jacobs is a really good example because Mark represents, you know, he's the hugest in my opinion designer to show in New York Fashion Week and he's usually one of the last shows to um, do his collection of the week 
and it is the hottest sort of show period in New York Fashion Week. And what Mark represents is that he is such a creative designer, so incredibly intelligent, yet he has his finger on the pulse of what's going to go, what the trend is for the entire season. What he the trend, sets the trend. He I sets the like. trend, exactly. And that permeates through magazine images, through you know, what ad campaigns will be shot, what the mood of the entire fashion season will be. And Mark somehow has a way of setting the tone. I'm sure there's some designers, you know, in other cities see Mark's show and maybe then as they're developing their collection, sort of, mm -hmm. you know, Sweet. amend. I know the stylists, they all look to Mark's show as sort of the pinnacle of what the, um, what the tone is of, um, the latest trends, Oh, basically. excuse me, and we have to say, New York is first on the circuit. Yes, it is, it's always first. New York is New York historically is always, always the first, the first thing. And, you know, again, with Marc Jacobs, he just has a way of balancing high art, creativity, and, you know, being a commercial fashion designer. And Marc has also held a long, I mean, he's just left Louis Vuitton, but he was um, the designer, head designer of Louis Vuitton for God knows how long, and he also went between Paris and New York. So mm -hmm. there's a real interchangeability between fashion and fashion cities. But New York specifically is, it's just where business happens. When I go to New York, it's, you're doing a shoot for Vogue or you're doing a major advertising. It's business, you know I mean? There's a lot of creativity there, but it is a massive industry. Just walking down, you know, Sixth Avenue, walking mm -hmm. into the fashion district, the photography studios, you know, they're big, multi-million, hundreds of million dollar industry that permeates New York, so much so that mm -hmm. Bloomberg has given so many initi like initiatives for, you know, the Absolutely, working with fashion. the CFDA, the Council of Fashion yeah. Designers of America. And, and it, is, it is just, it's everywhere. You can't escape New York without, I mean, mm -hmm. you're just without confronted with fashion. But for me personally, what I see of New York and what I see of New York Fashion Week, it, it's, you know, other cities may have more creativity, but New York is where it happens. That's where a lot of people get their start. That's where a lot of people get their stamp of approval because it's one thing to be an amazing creative designer, but you also have to make a living and you also have to create your brand. So mm -hmm. there's designers, like we mentioned, there's um, Michael Kors, Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren, Calvin Klein, who are the old masters who basically, before the word brand was cool, they already had that down. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they Ralph created Lauren has created a lifestyle that is, you know, how many people wear polo shorts all over the mm -hmm. world, or shirts, shall I say. And Calvin Klein, I mean, he is an incredible designer, but he was also a master, he is a master of marketing. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, mm -hmm. back when I was first starting modeling, I mean, his advertisings were incredible. So it's the business of imagery, it's the business of making incredible clothing that is durable, but also reasonable and attainable to people. And I think that's what New York and America represents, I mean, is that fashion yeah. that is attainable. Hobbyism. You look at Tori Burch, for instance, mm -hmm. who is a good friend, and she, I mean, she's blown up. I can't tell you in the airport how many, like, Tory Burch, like, flip-flops or handbags yeah, I absolutely. see, or Michael Kors, you know, we were Which, discussing yeah, absolutely. about Michael earlier, and, you know, I, I used to do Michael's show when I was... 18 years old and before Project Runway, before all that. And he was always a very successful designer, but his, mar his market was more Upper East Side, refined, lady who goes to Palm Springs mm -hmm. or to, you know. Your jet setter. Very, Carmen very Cass getting on a jet. Exactly, exactly. And that was his market. And then through Project Runway, he sort of exploded, but was a very smart guy and recognized that this was a time for him to expand his brand, and he, he really found a way to sort of do that and still be Michael Kors, you know? And again, how many people have a Michael Kors bag? And, exactly. You we know, were talking about how that's a very American thing to do. Yeah, actually, to sort of just... Which is the business. To make it a business, because mm -hmm. it is a business, and what these guys do also is create, you know, how many jobs, but also the luxury of fashion, you Absolutely. know? It's the lifestyle of it. It's, it, it. To see, like I said, Michael, Ralph Lauren, Calvin, those guys just, they've created an empire, mm -hmm. you know, a fashion empire, and New York is where you can do that. Donna Karen is another example. DK and, I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, and DVF, um, there DVF is another one. This is, uh, um, Diane von Furstenberg, I mean, she obviously invented the famous wrap dress, and every time I see, 
Dion. She is the mm -hmm. most foxiest woman you will ever meet. I mean, literally, you're just seduced by her every time. She just has this beautiful, yeah, long, incredible. glamorous hair. You feel like she's still in Studio 54 with Warhol. She's just, <laughs> she oozes it. Voice. But she is power so also. I mean, she is such yeah. power. Between her and Anna Winter, those two women run New York fashion. I mean, you know, Dion has got her. She, her, her um, presence is felt everywhere. She's a mm -hmm. great mentor to mm -hmm. young designers. She, um, you know, I say Diane because I'm from East Tennessee. Dion, but, um, but her, name, her name is Dion von Furstenberg. <laughs> Diane so. is a, she's, she's the, the chairwoman of the um, Council of Fashion Designers yeah. of America. And she's so, just, you know, powerful. every major fashion event, she will get up and she will speak and she will have the floor in a, rounds of applause. She's mm -hmm. the great supporter of fashion, but also really behind the scenes is a powerhouse on top of having mm -hmm. also her own massive empire that she's mm -hmm. built that is really sort of a feminist, strong, you know, yeah, strong label. And I don't know, I mean, that show I did was, again, she's just the sweetest woman and she's just so hot and she makes you feel really empowered and good about yourself and she likes women but she's found her market which is creating beautiful dresses for for women whereas calvin yeah. has got the sort of simplicity mm -hmm. and ralph has got his whole you know polo mm -hmm. lifestyle mm -hmm. you know very sort of hamptons in the 70s something yeah. i think is interesting about diane too is that she is this icon of American fashion, yet she's Belgian. Right, exactly. And you know, you find that in a lot right. of designers, like, like you don't have to be American to be American fashion. You yeah, know? yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you can be from all over the world to sort of dominate what the presence in American fashion is. I mean, Anna Winter is English, and right. she runs American Vogue and basically Condé Nast. I mean, she basically runs fashion, you know, and right. she's British, and half the editors, if not three quarters of the editors at Vogue, British. are all English, you know? You are I mean? taking over. We are. <laughs> Taken over, took over a long time ago. Okay, so, okay, Michael Kors is somebody, I think he is the quintessential New mm -hmm. York designer. He is. You know, he's a Long Island boy, done good. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking about him earlier, just what a character he is. He's what a, a real character. And like I said before, with um, his explode, I mean, he was already wildly successful prior to Project Runway, but Michael has. Um, He's glamorous as mm -hmm, a man, mm -hmm. you know? He's always sort of well put together. Everything is impeccable. Good. He smells good, exactly. <laughs> He's a gorgeous boyfriend. He, they're just such a power couple. And yeah. he makes, he loves women and he makes women look beautiful. But he also is a good businessman. Mm -hmm. And that is key to have good business sense. And mm -hmm. Michael has impeccable business sense and knows when to sort of strike when the iron is hot. And that's what New York represents as far as the fashion industry is concerned is, again, it's that line between creating, creating beautiful clothing, mm -hmm. creating a lifestyle, creating the buzzword, the brand, mm -hmm. but then the empire. And American fashion designers have all that at their fingertips, or right. designers who market for an American market or global market, obviously, right. but it's, pretty, like, it's showed in New York City. And that's where a lot of the buyers come. That's where a lot mm -hmm. of very commercial sort of commerciality of fashion is really represents in New York. So we're going to move on to London. Yes. And this is from an Alexander McQueen oh, show. So show. <laughs> talk a little bit about your relationship with. Well, he is a dear, dear friend. People I mean, we wouldn't call him Alexander. His name, real name was Lee. And he was a dear, dear friend. Lee was just one of the coolest, brilliant people. He was like the Francis Bacon of fashion mm. design. I mean, he just a, a vital, brilliant artist. And what he represented in London and London, it's what London still represents, is high art and hyper creativity. I mean, just, it's the place where fashion is an installation. Fashion will just transport you. Same with the magazine, the fashion magazines. Mm -hmm. You look at pop, you look at love, you look at these brilliant sort of domineering forces of fashion that are the um, stamp of high The avant-garde. Oh, absolutely. Like London is, and London that's what London is. And, you know, this show, for instance, was, um, he did something brilliant. His shows were never, it was never a typical fashion show. You'd never do a fashion show for Alexander McQueen. It was right. always an installation and there would be something, a really grand um, concept behind it. And this basically was the Madhouse show where he made a box that was mirrored so we couldn't see the audience at all. We could just see the mirrors. So we had a, a choreographer and an acting teacher who would just say you have oh, to just wow. freak out you have to like act like you're insane it was the it was, i think it was called asylum the show actually right, right, right. and it was 
insane. And <laughs> yeah. people just were freaking out inside and out. And I had this incredible jewelry, you know, I don't know what you would call it. It was just bonkers. And my shoes were the typical McQueen heelless shoes that are really, really high platforms. And I couldn't move in the dress and I had this, you know, Thorns. Sculpture that's and I like fell. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt after I, after I was in the madhouse, basically, and I felt completely legitimately mad at that point. And uh, as we, I was walking off, you know, sort of like if I was going back here, there was a screen, and I tripped because those girls like beating themselves up. They like one dress was made entirely out of shells, and this one girl like got herself all bloody, and there was like. It was just like blood on the floor insane. shells and I tripped up over these shells from the dress and went flying and like cut all my neck up with that. But then I had, you know... Slave to fashion. Exactly. And then McQueen, lovely Lee, like took my hand afterwards because we all had to walk out again and he walked out with me and held my hand oh, and he sweet. was shaking. He was absolutely, he was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, but oh. it was brilliant. <laughs> like, <laughs> Bless his heart. It's like, yeah, at least I didn't die. But <laughs> Bless his heart. All right. But that's, you know, that's what he represents. Right. And still, what Alexander McQueen represents, mm -hmm. what the incredible Sarah Burton, who she now shows in Paris, but it, it, it's avant-garde, high creativity. Mm -hmm. it, it's the stuff out of fantasies, you know, whereas New York to count, mm -hmm. contra contradict is more the stuff of big business, of becoming a massive success. Mm -hmm. London, you know you're gonna, like, your success is going to be based on something entirely different. And that's why there's not, I guess, as many designers that emerge from London mm -hmm. that are as successful, but they're, what their success is, is their, is their like, high art creativity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of very, you know, withstanding designers who've had long withstanding careers have come from London. Okay, so we're going to move on next. You've got to set this one up. <laughs> this this is was the during the Olympics, <laughs> if you can imagine this. This was, I'm in a Burberry dress. I think that's, I don't know what team that is, but. I'm gonna go into this one because you can I talk did about all your a girls. fashion show at the end of the Olympics, the British Olympics, when we hosted it in London. And um, not the British Olympics, the, the, when London hosted yeah, yeah. it. There you go. Once the again, British owning Olympics. The Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Taking over. And it was, they just decided, they asked at the end if um, sort of all the best of British talent ultimately, I mean, could come and congregate together, so they had a fashion element in it, of it, and you can see there was Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, Stella Tennant, Lily so Cole, Georgia May Jagger, um, Jordan Dunn, and I think that's it, I think that, and Lily Donaldson. And we all walked out in different British fashion designers. I was wearing Burberry, beautiful, gilded, gorgeous, made to measure. All these dresses were just made for us for this one Literally day. made for you. Literally yeah, made yeah. for us, and it was wild. We oh, did a amazing. crazy fashion show at the Olympics, and it was absolutely, I I've this. never, my dad was there, and it was the most perfect thing for my dad to see, you know, what a oh, proud God, dad at right? that point. I mean, there was probably, I can't tell you how, probably hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, mm. it was just during we saw the closing ceremony. I mean, it was how many people here watched that? I, I was sitting at home watching it, and I had this moment of a huge civic pride, Nashville pride. I was like, look at our girl up there at the Olympics. Crossing her fingers that I won't trip Nashville up. Nashville yeah, winning at like, the Olympics. It was amazing. But again, that was a, that's what Britain represents, though. What London represents. We are so, like, London fashion is so supportive of their own mm -hmm. and of fashion. You know what I mean? It, and it's massively important. And when I go to London, I've got to say, it's what I really do miss about where I'm from. I very much miss it because the kids are so individual. I mean, when I mm -hmm. walk down the street in London, fashion means something and individuality means something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it kind of drives me insane sometimes because I want to scream mm -hmm. at teenagers here, like, you can do it. You can, you can do better. You can dye your well, hair. You, know, you can cut it off. You can make your own dresses. London is home of the youth quake. London is where punk was born. But London it's still is, that. Yeah, it's still, it's still got, still it. got I mean, that. I mean, I was sitting at a restaurant last time. I was there, and I sort of commented. I'm like, everybody's unique. Everybody has something that makes them them there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it, it's still, fashion is still like DIY and punk, like you were saying, and still has this sort of spontaneity about it that I really, really love. People, mm -hmm. it, it's, I don't know, I, I love, I love that. I love just sitting down mm -hmm. and watching the kids because it, it's for such a small country and such a small city, relatively to the rest of the world, mm -hmm. so much is happening there. Right. 
Well, that's a good segue. And there's to Tom Ford. There you go. This is Tom Ford sometimes shows in London. Tom Ford shows all over the world. He's and a Texan. He's an American. He is. And what a dear guy he is. What a man. Tom Ford also incredible mm -hmm. film director. He's just sort of the, the high tastemaker. I mean, I am madly in love with Tom mm -hmm. Ford. He's such a great guy. And but he I've chooses to show in London. Yeah, he chooses to show in London, although he shows all over the place. And he did mm -hmm. a couple of shows in London because he felt that London was really hot again. And mm -hmm. in a way, London was becoming, while it's always been a very creative city, it was also becoming um, yet again sort of the fashion capital. In a way, there was a point where people were beginning to think he was going to eclipse mm -hmm. other fashion cities. And I think the fact that having Tom Ford there really boosted London Fashion Week for a number of years. But again, Tom represents the bridge of both things. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tom's label now, he was, you know, worked at Gucci for years, then at um, Yves Saint Laurent, then took some time out and made beautiful film, then started again with his beauty company and his now clothing company, which he has private investors, which is very rare for fashion because there's usually sort of a conglomerate of mm -hmm. major fashion investors or fashion companies that will come and Right. And build design. your brand or you'll be the designer for another brand. But mm -hmm. Tom's really doing it grassroots but in very Tom Ford style, which is the best of the best, the best in of everything. The best. I mean right. he just is. I mean you yeah. walk into the room and he's sort of always like on sophisticated and charming. Okay, so that's a great segue to Carl Lagerfeld yep. and Chanel. Chanel, there you go. So Carl is just where do I begin with Carl? He is brilliant. He is a, he's a very modern man for being mm -hmm. such, you know, from being around at Chanel for God knows how many decades. He's always looking forward. Mm -hmm. And that's also what Paris is. Again, Paris quite like London, but very, it's still very different to London. It has um, its own sort of bourgeois old set and old guard, you know, I mean, the history of couture that mm -hmm. art, like, originates from Paris. So Paris, you really feel that it's the mix of sort of, um, the new wave mm -hmm. meets with old school classic houses, fashion houses that have, you know, the seamstress that's probably been there for 50 mm -hmm. years, the history that is like steeped in sort of Parisian French culture. And that's Chanel, obviously, yeah, with Coco totally. Chanel. And Carl, I don't know, he's, oh, he's, a, he's a master. Right. He's a master at things. He's a brilliant guy on top of everything else, but he's, he, He's, a, he's everything. When you work with Carl, he's sketching the dress as you're about to wear it, like this is what needs to be fixed. He's a brilliant sketcher. I mean, mm -hmm. his sketches are legendary, actually. Mm -hmm. The way Carl mm -hmm. can sort of draw fashion is unlike anybody else. He takes photographs. Oh, God, this is when I'm a baby. This is when I was 18 and I was... Chanel, first couture show, show, Chanel couture, there was a bride always at the Chanel couture show, and I was the black swan bride, and there was another girl as the, the white swan, and I was really happy to be the black swan because I was a rebellious teenager. Right, and exactly, really, you were like living like, up to like, yes, them. I will be the punk, yeah. But so again, it's, what you're seeing there obviously is not just my face, but I'm wearing this beautiful <laughs> hat that probably is a, is a swan, and the intricacy of what that piece took, how much work it took. It's like hand-stitched. Mm -hmm. um, the Chanel house specifically has um, a massive team of women that since, for 20 years since I've started doing shows for Chanel up until now, they are still there. Right. They're, the house is huge, it's real protocol. They wear the sort of white smocks. You know, they've always got gloves on their hands. It's really, really organized and order. Yet then you have Carl, who's a wild card. And again, who is always throwing crazy ideas into the mix. Carl is a modernist. I mean, he is 83 going on 84 right now, but the man is obsessed with what's happening next, mm -hmm. you know? And he's, he, that's what keeps him relevant. I mean, I think right now, Kendall Jenner is the right. face of Chanel. Who would have thought, you know? But again, you've got to applaud him because he's also being forward thinking and it's the Chanel establishment. When I first started modeling, it was a risk, you know, I was sort of, I shaved my eyebrows off, I had crazy hair right. colors. I was a real like punk weirdo. And I did a couple of Vogue covers, but it really takes somebody like Chanel to give, give you legitimacy. Well, that's interesting because like we were talking about you were yeah. named the face of Chanel in 98, yeah. so that would have For been... For a couple of years afterwards, yeah. and that's what gave me legitimacy within the old guard of fashion. And 
you know, I was considered sort of this modern weirdo. And then a couple of Chanel campaigns later, you're accepted into the old school, the Valentinos of mm. fashion, the Christian mm -hmm. Dior's of fashion. Those people accept you then, you know? So it's interesting to see Carl always moving forward, but he's a real renegade in that sense. I mean, he's a character. I don't know, he's a, he's a funny... Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> okay, so this is Louis Vuitton. Yes, and again, we talked about Marc Jacobs. So Marc Jacobs for years um, also was at the helm, on top of his own label, was at the helm of Louis Vuitton as well, and really revamped the brand to become um, back to sort of the iconic sort of leisure, travel and leisure brand that it was. I mean, I remember when he um, first started designing for Vuitton, his shows were just this massive spectacle. I mean, mm -hmm. the bags, I mean, all the artists that he would collaborate with. Um, who like those Sprouse with? bags, those early Sprouse, Sprouse bags. The Sprouse bags were just remarkable. And how genius was that, yeah, though, too? I mean, and again, it, shows, it showed a change in fashion, though, around this time mm -hmm. with um, Marc going to Vuitton, because Paris, historically, has always been, as I said, sort of the romantic, dreamy, Gautier, um, old guard, classic fashion houses that were just sort of steeped in history, but then big conglomerates, you know, mm -hmm. sort of came in and started buying iconic companies and then placing designers who were not connected to the label in to other, and you know, Louis Vuitton into, is owned by LVMH. LVMH, yeah. Also owns it's basically the biggest, everybody. yeah, basically, you know, you name it. You're not owned by Prada, you're owned by LVMH. They, 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 they own it all. And they created, but they made fashion a billion dollar business. You know, I mean, and I know this is always like, ah, oh, it was better before, but the truth is, there was a real shift around this point when Mark mm -hmm. came into Vuitton, and we could flip on that later when it goes, when we talk about Muccia Prada and Milan, because mm -hmm. it, it became, when I first started modeling, it was always about the dress. It was always about the complete outfit. When um, Mark Jacobs started um, working with Vuitton, then all of a sudden accessories became important. It became oh, God, about the, it the bag. bag. It became about the shoes. That was when Fendi did the bag. Yeah, yet. Balenciaga. Like, when Nicolas yeah. Gasquier started at Balenciaga, it was the you might not want to buy the four thousand dollar crazy dress, but you might you buy, buy the one thousand dollar bag. Right. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> or the but they, twenty dollar lipstick. But you know, like all of a sudden, <laughs> the hence why lipstick is always That's why in fashion. Was there you go. Right, right, right. But it's funny how fashion changed. It changed where accessories became. Big, big business. And I, I must say, between Prada and Marc Jacobs with Vuitton, that was the real genesis of, mm -hmm. of the shift being fashion more accessible Absolutely. to everybody. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's hence when fast a bigger, fashion bigger, really took business. over and started knocking them off. Yep. Over yep. There. And that's whole okay, so here we have another wonderful classic Parisian brand, Saint Laurent. Yep, Yves Saint Laurent. And I actually did a show when um, the actual Yves Saint Laurent was still. Um, at the helm of the house, which was incredible, and such mm. a history of modeling. I mean, he, Saint Laurent, historically, would always use the same models for decades. We, and the Pat Cleveland's. He, for, those... Just before Pat Cleveland, and oh mm -hmm. God, how can you not love Pat? But um, he asked if I'd do the show, but it was a real education because it was, you know, sort of in the grunge era that, <laughs> right. you know, didn't have to do all this twirling around and like taking the coats off and the gloves and sort of like modeling, quote unquote. And it was such an amazing experience. And he was such a gentleman and wow. really loved women so much. And then obviously he left Saint Laurent, then left his company. And then Tom Ford took mm -hmm. control. And I did many shows with Tom Ford, did many perfume campaigns for Saint Laurent. Then worked after Tom left with Stefano Pilati. Mm -hmm. And that's where this picture was with Stefano. So I have a really long history with Yves Saint Laurent. I mean, these pictures were taken, I think, I just had my son and was really like drained, said, yeah. tired, and really excited to go to London. Two thousand seven. Yes, yeah, so I just had my. Yeah. I just had Henry, I believe. Yeah, it was like September, like a month or two after having him, and I was just, I don't know, excited to. I'll bet. To go away for a couple okay, of days. Okay, so sticking on the subject of ad campaigns, but moving to Milan. Yes, we are. Prada. Prada. Yes, and uh, this is again, what represents iconic Italian fashion. What Milan represents, and it's, it, it, it represents so much, and I think Milan sometimes in the grand scheme of things, mm -hmm. not for fashion insiders, but in the grand scheme of things, gets not a bad It's a little bit of a short shrift. It gets like, yeah. people will get Milan because they think it's too commercial. Right. Milan is where, again, craftsmanship 
all the best factories are in Milan. All the best sort of artisans and, you know, business, again, it's the business like New York, but it's not, it's different. It's different than New York. And it's I feel like so, it's having a revival Milan is, too. lives and breathes fashion. Milan itself is, you don't have tourist sites in Milan really, unless you want to go to the Duomo, which is beautiful, mm -hmm. but you could go to Venice and you could go to Florence. Milan is fashion. It is, that's the city's industry, period. You know mm -hmm. I mean? Everybody's well dressed in Milan. Everybody's connected to fashion somehow. I mean, it is just that's what it represents. And Prada, Michia Prada, she, I mean, I can't inf like enthusiastically sort of praise her enough. I mean, mm -hmm. she represents again high art architecture. Her stores are always built by incredible architects, like really cutting edge architects. I mean, mm -hmm. people like who that build, Room Kula store in yeah. New York is a I mean, example. and people who build, you know, world class museums. I mean, Michia really has a way of finding the best people and the most talented people at the top of their game. She had, um, I believe, Wes Anderson and Wong Kai Wah, I think, yeah. the directors to do her perfume campaigns. Um, Stephen Meisel has shot Prada since when this started up until now, this day. And she's unwavering. She's an incredibly strong woman. There's no small talk with Nuccia at all. Ever. She is direct, she's straightforward. Her team, her design team, know exactly what she wants. It is precise, it's well made, but it's also unwavering in who, what her vision, mm -hmm. what Prada's vision is. And that's what Milan represents. Yeah, and to me, she really represents the essence of the Italian um, style show in that she puts great value on quality and materials and construction, yet she is totally on the cutting edge and very modern. She's the total she modernist. She's absolutely a modernist and absolutely always oh, looking Sorry. forward and is very, very intelligent. And you feel that when you're in her presence. I mean, it is, you know, I think a lot of people may consider like fashion as this sort of like good old time, a big old party and so fabulous. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it's real hard work and big business. And Mutia represents that. You know, like her studio is like, it's probably the size of this room and it's stark and it's white and it's in an industrial part of Milan. And you just have people, again, in white coats, working, you know, cutting, sewing, you know, you, you'll do your fittings and it's silence, you know, and you could wait until three o'clock in the morning until your dress is basically been handmade wow. there. But it's really, um, she's incredibly serious about what she does and Again, that's Milan for me. Yeah. It's like the people I work with in Milan, they're, they're not messing around, let's mm -mm. put it that way. And they're factories as well. The um, level of production in Milan and in Italy in general, I mean, I, I've got friends who um, have their clothing and accessories manufactured just outside of Milan, mm -hmm. like in Torino or mm -hmm. just outside of Venice. But again, they are artisans. These guys, I went with my friend, um, just for a little, a little quick visit a long time ago. And it, it's not like a factory you've seen here in the US. I mean, these, these guys mm -hmm. have, again, it's a family business gone from one person down to the next. And it is quality at its highest. And that's a good point about Musha too. It's like she, her family has Prada's 1917, I think, mm -hmm. is when Prada was founded. It was mm -hmm. a leather company up until mm -hmm. 1995 when she launched her first collection. Right. And the fact that she turned the industry around based on, it was called the school, the lunch lady right. collection right. because it looked so dowdy, right. but she really, it was during, once again, it was right after the grunge era, so people right. were thinking differently about that. And she represents then. that. Her, like, her silhouette is always the same. Mm -hmm. She is really a... a as you said, a modernist in the way that like Conde Garçon or Yoji Yamamoto, yet she also has this innate femininity where she makes, you know, the clothing, I love Prada clothing, but it really is, it's not the sort of It's thing. not easy to wear. It's not easy to wear. Anna Winter, the editor-in-chief of Vogue, she usually either wears Oscar de la Renta or Prada. Mm -hmm. It's like her exclusively, her, her outfit. And so many major fashion editors, there's the um, editor-in-chief of um, Chinese Vogue, actually, or I've known her forever. She, only wears Prada, hmm. you know? It's like the staple, again, of taste, you know? Mm -hmm. And not just taste, um, what is the right word? It's just, it, it hits the spot. It hits the spot, and people mm -hmm. in fashion feel like they're, mm -hmm. you know. Well, we're gonna move on to Gucci. Oh, Gucci. So My talk a little bit about Alessandro. this photo. Alessandro. He's a darling. He is the new creative director at Gucci. And again, this is a whole new thing that's happening in fashion right now, is that 
designers will come and go. Back when I first started, a designer was at a house and he stayed at the house until something tragic, you know, like until death. he maybe wasn't alive anymore. <laughs> that or, doesn't happen anymore. Scandal. That doesn't happen. Designers are kind of like models. They're, in, mm. you know, we're all interchangeable in the fashion industry. We've all got the knife to our back really quickly these days. So <laughs> it's, that's what happens now, you know. Designers will come in and out of these big established companies because there's often a change needed. We see this with Saint Laurent, like um, Hedy Sleman, who is a fantastic man, brilliant photographer, and I knew him when he was a photographer and then the menswear designer of Christian Dior. Now he works for Saint Laurent, he changed the name, and I read an interview with him the other day, it was brilliant, because a lot of people in fashion were like, how dare he change the Saint Yves Saint Laurent and cut he the He changed it out. just to Saint Laurent. And he said, well, he made a big I'm never going to be it. Yves Saint Laurent. And I think, you know, he made a beautiful quote that, basically wiped the floor with people hating him, that he said, I'm doing it out of honor for Yves Saint Laurent because I I will never be him. Exactly, and there we go. So then here we have, you know, lovely Alessandro Michelli. He is a great friend and a really, really wonderful, spirited, warm, kind-hearted man. And he just took over recently from- um, Frida Gianni. From Frida, yeah, yeah, exactly, from Gucci. And it was a pretty, he basically had to make an entire collection in a couple of weeks. I mean, I saw him in New York, I want to say it was for, yeah, it was pre-fall, I think, or resort, I don't know, I can't keep track, but he um, developed and created this entire collection that was new, that was um, refreshing. The show was incredibly feminine, incredibly bright. It was really um, luxurious. And it was very quirky, too. It was very, and he is very quirky. Which so is, uh, it's a Gucci's whole new era for, for Gucci right now. And yeah. again, when you think about the history of Gucci, I mean, I have, that was one of the first shows I did in Milan, was when Tom Ford was at the helm mm -hmm. of Gucci, and it was the, I don't know if anyone here is old enough to remember, <laughs> I think it was like Madonna back in, what was She what did was the ad song? campaign in 95. She, she didn't do the ad campaign, but she wore the clothes Oh, she wore the like clothes to the VH1 VH1 Awards. VH1 Awards, and it was yeah. a whole. Amber Valletta did that. Exactly, that was it, Amber Valletta yeah. with the sort of the silk shirt. It really yeah. represented like. Open to here, and like these velvet, low velvet slung pants, trousers. Yeah. He was, changed the silhouette. Yeah, and he like, you know, Tom reinvented Gucci, again, mm -hmm. from sort of being you know, we've from being the Gucci family, which, you know, again, you can recognize what Gucci is. You can recognize the logo and the emblem and whatnot, but these designers will come in and really drastically sort of shift what the tone is. And I, I can see this with Alessandro. I'm really curious as to where he's gonna go next, because I think he's gonna make Gucci maybe a little bit more romantic and a little less sort of uh, jet set. It was so interesting because, um I, when I saw his first show, I was like, well, this is like a really good but weird Prada show. Yeah, completely. I, <laughs> it it just, was absolutely like that. Yes, yeah, I mean, to give him, you know, to sort of reference that. But you know what I'm thinking, and I don't know this for it's sure. The color combinations. The color well. combinations. But I'm looking at the sweater here, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll bet you that he went in and found an old pattern in the archives right. and pulled that out and put it on the sweater. I mean, that's how young designers, or designers who are coming into old fashioned houses are revitalizing them. They're taking right. I mean, elements. they'll go to the archives and they'll take snippets out of it and, and then re imagine them and he has an incredible team behind mm -hmm. him to do that so again it's a whole new mm -hmm. whole new world for gucci but again what alessandro represents he was frida's assistant for a long time and that also happened with um chloe back it's in BBC, when stella mccartney yeah. was um doing chloe before she started her own line phoebe Mm -hmm. Philo, who was who's now the incredible designer of Celine, she was Stella's assistant and then she went on to do Chloe and then a bunch of other things and then ended up at Celine. So, so the always beautiful be nice thing, to the assistants. Yeah, exactly. Always be, always nice. be nice to the assistants. Isn't assistant. that right, Leslie? <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so we're going from a new designer at an old house to a very uh, very what, what's the word I'm using for them? It's Dolce & Gabbana. Dolce & Gabbana. They, they, They've been around they're, they're forever, just, they've but they forever, but they represent just like art, fashion, fun, like getting dressed up. They're such wonderful guys. I love Stefano and Domenico. They are so much fun. And this actually was not in Milan. This was in Venice. It was for the Altamoda, which is the Italian version of Couture. The Altamoda show in Venice, uh, I want to say 2013, maybe a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And they, it's very exclusive. They only have maybe American Vogue, French Vogue, and Italian Vogue, who allow, maybe British, allowed to be the press there. And then it's just clientele. It's just the people 
who wear so people are gonna spend Dolce the money. Couture, basically. So it was, you know, prin princesses, duchesses, mm -hmm. baronesses, and <laughs> so on and so forth. And something we were talking earlier to Megan about this, um, the aversion, well, not aversion, but a piece from the Sicil Sicilian collection is in the exhibit. Yeah. They say they've got a couple of Altamoda pieces, mm -hmm. perhaps, in the, in the exhibit, yes. And again, what they do, because I've seen what they do, and I've been in their atelier and watched them work, it is painstaking. That dress probably took four months stitch by hand to make. You know, every little, it's sparkly, what you can't see. Everything is stitched piece by piece. I, I mean, bet they I, don't let you drink coffee while you're wearing that, do they? they or do. red wine? They're lovely, yeah. they're fine. <laughs> they, they, they're Italian, they're, you know. They're I back. think after that we all went to Cipriani's in Venice and sat by the water and had more pasta and then they had a Venetian ball at this 13th century palace as in you Venice, do. as you do, with um, courtesans <laughs> showing us all how to dance. And it was a masquerade ball, so everybody had to dress in character, and I wore a big couture dress. And oh, okay, which is a wonderful awesome. yeah. segue into, but okay. They, oh, there you go, there you go. That was a little Instagram-y picture. I mean, again, the gold is made by hand. I mean, they, and it's gold. It's real gold. It ain't it no. Gold. It's not no chintz. This stuff. This is. It's, <laughs> it's not metal. <laughs> not no chintz. It is. You've got like more security than you can imagine <laughs> around you. But even then, they're Italian, so they're not really following you. So <laughs> you know, they're just kind of like. That's only the Americans. They're kind of checking you out and maybe hoping you go. Like maybe if they could give you a little phone number for later. But, <laughs> yeah. So that was before the Couture show, actually. And um, again, it's Dolce, you know, they, 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 they love women, they love dressing mm -hmm. women, they are, you know, their silhouette. It, it, when you do a Dolce show, they always give you like this amazing bodysuit to wear underneath. It's got like a padded bra. Oh, amazing. It cinches you in, screw the specs because yeah. the Dolce, the yeah. do I mean, it gives you like the tiny, teeny, tiniest waist and like flatters everything and gives you this perfect hourglass figure. And they do it for every show and every woman. They That's give wonderful. you like this beautiful bodysuit and you feel like everything's lifted and squeezed in and you just feel really sexy. Oh, and right. they want you to look like a woman. They're all about the boobs. They're all about, just the, they're all about They women. really are, they always do the little They're the, all the about the women, the, yeah. the being a woman. And I feel like, again, getting back onto sort of the craftsmanship, there's a real, um, they complement each other a lot, mm -hmm. both Stefano, Stefano and Domenico. Um, because I would say Domenico is more, um, he's the one sort of cutting and pinning things and, you know, putting the appliques on things. And then Stefano is sort of the drama and the big sort of flamboyancy of what Dolce Gabbana mm -hmm. is. But again, these things are, I mean, the reason they're so expensive is because it took a long time to make and they're not going cheap on any of these fabrics. I like mean, that's hand painted. I remember that collection. That was hand painted. Yeah. yeah that was, I mean, come on. Like, Beautiful. Okay, so we've got to go into this next. Oh, yeah. I kind of want to set this up because when I saw the first picture of you of this, I was like, oh my God, this was the <laughs> most memorable look from the Met Ball there this year. It was there like in every you. magazine, on every TV show. And you have no idea how long that took to make. And that bodice is gold also. Like, and they, you know, obviously took my measurements. And I was really crossing my fingers when I got there. I'm like, you know, because I always kind of lie. I'm like, yeah, I'm much tinier. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more, you know. Doesn't every woman, you know. I'm, I'm, you don't need to know reality. I'll just be that when I'm there. I mean. And so I was really nervous when I saw the actual gold bodice. I'm like, what am I going to do? I can't actually, like, it's not, you can't really lie when you've got gold <laughs> So it was really tight and beautiful. But again, I mean, he, they brought, Dolce brought their team over. How long did it take to make the, what was the process? That was for did one they of the call you and shows ask you? and then they, they customized the gold. Okay. And it, I know it took so it months existed. upon months and then upon they, months okay. upon months to make. Wow. And again, it was, it, it, it can't really explain through the picture what it looks like, but it's kind of sort of this sheer gold webbing almost that is just sort of molded onto my body and the so clothes was interesting my god i took people down in that dress that night. <laughs> there was a point i think who was it oh it was kim kardashian and kanye west were trying to get past me and i'm like sorry guys sorry, not gonna happen you have skirt. to wait for me <laughs> <laughs> and they did. Awesome. they did <laughs> there was they no did. way they were gonna there was no way they were gonna get because your best me. friend tabitha was also dressed by them she too, was dressed by, because so. my best friend tabitha is an incredible shoe designer who wearing her shoes and um, she is basically 
the muse for Dolce Gabbana. She works, she's worked with them for the past seven or eight years. Um, she styles all their shows. Every styles by meaning, it, it's not even, it's beyond styling. I mean, she is their confidant. She advises them on trends. She advises them on what they should be doing, how they should be doing it. She'll edit their collections. Um, and she's always traveling to sort of far, wide, and crazy places to sort of do things like this. Yeah, she's and she's also an editor at Vogue, so she's power, power woman, right? Of all things. But again, that took a long time to make. And again, this is Milan. This is fashion. When this is the business of fashion. Mm -hmm. I mean, these moments for red carpet, for instance, they're not for everybody. Obviously, I mean that dress, that beautiful creation is really for a few select people. Maybe that is going to be just somebody, you know, a countess is going to buy that or something, mm -hmm. you know? And then they have their clothing for the mass market as well. Mm -hmm. But this is, you, you've always got to find a way to do your, like, beautiful creative moments and then find a way to sort of reach the masses. And Milan has a way of doing that. But mm -hmm. Milan really does, it is expensive. You're not going to get cheap in Milan. Milan Fashion, Prada, Dolce. It's so expensive. You know, Valentino, which now is a Parisian line, mm -hmm. you know. They're not cheap lines, you mm -hmm. know. They are well made and they are, you know, Prada is, yes, a cashmere sweater could cost you over a, a grand, if not more, two grand. But it's because it's been made the best. The very best. The, the very best. best materials, yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on and talk about Nashville. But what's, can yes. I get the time real quick? What, how are we? 7.27. We're oh, doing well, perfect. great. We, you were doing terrific. See, <laughs> Libby and I have to have it. We could just talk and talk. We could be here until 8.30. So I'm We really... practiced for like, we were just blah, 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 And we asked Leslie how long it would take. She was like, oh, 25 minutes. And we'd only like, just got to thought New York. it was five. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so talking about Nashville. Yes. You, we both moved here around the same time. Yeah like in the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. And fashion wise, it was a very different landscape mm -hmm. than it is now. I didn't know fashion in Nashville up until a few years ago, if I'm really honest with you. It's only just sort of come into my awareness. I mean, obviously I knew that there was the Manuels. And right, right, right. Yada, yada, yadas, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't privy up until, you know, sort of getting to know you, mm -hmm. that there was a really big community in Nashville that is sort of flourishing and blooming. So yeah, it's it's happening for sure. I mean, I feel like the past year alone, people who live here, I'm sure can feel that there is um, sort of the ground shaking a little bit with what's potentially happening mm -hmm. in Nashville. But again, it's all these things, you know, it's like building the infrastructure mm -hmm. for a viable fashion industry to exist. And the infrastructure is, um, it's the most important part. It I mean, is the most important part. I think you touched on it before when you said you can have a fashion show. Anybody can have a fashion show. We can all have a fashion show. Shit, I have a fashion show practically <laughs> every day in front of my mirror. Do right. you know yes, what I mean? Yes, <laughs> when no one's looking. Yes. But you've got to have a business behind it to back it. Because right. otherwise, I think that's the tragedy of a lot of sort of... Um, emerging markets in fashion. Mm -hmm. Even California is difficult. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, California, obviously you've got the Golden Globes, you've got the Oscars, you've got all the brilliant events that happen and Rodate and those mm -hmm. designers can sort of be at the helm there, but it's still hard. LA Fashion Week still is a little... Yeah, we were talking about that. It, it can be a little really sketchy, evolved. but then Tom Ford went and did a fashion show, but it's completely devoid of Fashion Week just before the Oscars, which is so smart because every actress... And Genius marketing. They're all an actor and director, yada, yada. They're mm -hmm. all wearing Tom mm -hmm. Ford, you know? Mm -hmm. But Nashville has an interesting... A lot going for it, let's just put it that way. I mean, you've got an entertainment industry that's here. You don't have to invent that. You know, it's already here. Thank right, the market's God. there. So the market is there. Yeah. But now you just have to bring people to believe in it and believe in it, but maybe think differently. And Nashville's never going to be New York. It's never going to be Paris. It's never going to be Milan or London. It's going to be Nashville. And that's brilliant of why mm -hmm. that's what people have to focus on, mm -hmm. I think, is creating Nashville fashion. Let's show a couple of pictures. Yes. Um, so your lovely assistant, Leslie yes. Stevens, designs a line called Ola May. She does. Lovely Leslie. She's an incredible designer. Mm -hmm. um, makes beautiful, beautiful clothing called Ola May. And I actually um, wore one of her dresses at the um, Nashville Fashion Alliance at, um, the party, on, on party, the party at Imogene and Willie the other day. Saturday and so night. did the Watson twins and so did the lovely Margot Price. And there's a lot of talent 
in this town. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people who really do need to find, like, have their mentors here mm -hmm. and have people from out of Nashville come in and sit down and give them like good sound fashion advice Absolutely. on how to build your business because you could be the most creative person in the world and like I've said if you don't have somebody mm -hmm. sort of stoking the coals beneath you mm -hmm. but also giving you practical pragmatic mm -hmm. business advice it's gonna it's hard it's a yeah. hard business and there's you know when you look at businesses even online retails look at nasty gal for instance how oh she God. was just yeah. like a stylist slash vintage collector and has created this massive brand you yeah, know an empire. reformation for instance i mean brilliant i love mm -hmm. reformation and it's interesting to see what they've created and i feel like these things are possible mm -hmm. in nashville it's possible to create like you said an ecosystem mm -hmm. and a microcosm of fashion mm -hmm. that is unique to nashville and we have that with imogene and willie mm -hmm. i feel mm -hmm. like you know i mean but i feel Reed like it's progressed nashville. i feel like when 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 nashville first started coming on the fashion scene and i do give imogene and willie a lot of credit mm -hmm. for putting it on the international fashion mm -hmm. scene, on, on the national you know on the map but I feel cool. like now I everything's evolved. I mean, this kinda, is Black you know, by Maria Silver, and it's right. and you know Olame, Black by Maria Silver. It's like there's a much more modernist, right? Like the clothing doesn't look it's so not stuck what in the people, hair. It's this not is Amanda what people Valentine. expect, you know. And I think often when people come to Nashville, they're expecting sort of like all of us. Well, to they're be expecting like cowboy hats and, and yeah. you know, decked out, which is fine, mm -hmm. you know. But there is talent here mm -hmm. from you know Black by Maria Silver, from Olame, and from Amanda Valentine as well. We all know mm -hmm. and love. There is real talent in the town, and I'm what wearing I Elizabeth like, Suzanne today. Actually, oh, that's I'm mixing dress, Elizabeth Suzanne with Prada, so I like. Oh, those shoes are really good. Yeah. Right? Anyway, I'm um, representing <laughs> both, city, both of our stylish cities. I'm just in vintage. There you oh, go. It's vintage, good. my it's friend. Good vintage, shoes, though. Wait, you want to take some questions? Sure. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, if you're not getting anything, just speak really loudly, people. How's that? Come on, someone's got a question. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would like to know how the internet, the agency, internet, and live streaming has affected the vibe in the Nashville area. Because I think it's Massively so, I actually think. I mean, look, to contradict what I just said, you'll never get what, you know, from a live stream, what touching, right. feeling, looking at the clothes on the runway, seeing them made in front of you. There's, that's why fashion editors, that's why everyone in fashion, we do the fashion circus a couple times a year. Now it seems like four times a year. Now know, the resort's becoming so much all, more you know, prevalent. And we all sit and look at these clothes and take, you know, the editors take notes. They, it's nothing like seeing it in the flesh, outfit after outfit. But that said, for um, people who can't be there, it's revolutionized it. It's made fashion less exclusive and more for, um, more for people, more, more for everybody. Because the thing is, is that fashion, um, you know, when I first started be becoming a model, it was, far more um, mysterious and elusive. Mm -hmm. And I kind of still like that about what I do, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, you can sort of overdo it, but there is something to be said that a lot of magazines now, you know, Vogue has Vogue.com, that probably more people look at Vogue.com than they do the physical magazine. I oh, look yeah, at the magazine, absolutely. you know, but it's the same in fashion. Style.com revolutionized, mm -hmm. you know, how you even pull outfits for a shoot. I mean, mm -hmm. I get asked, you know, do you want to wear this on the shoot? And they'll send me the style.com image right. or the runway, you know, the show that's streamed. Mm -hmm. And I can pick what outfits I want based on that. That you, Yeah, in some senses, you don't really have to be there anymore. But it has made fashion, um, it's opened the world of fashion up, I think. And it's opened it for people to dream as well and to realize that you can have your own line and not be in a major fashion city, but totally. you can still explode your brand and really like really get your um your point across online helmet Absolutely. lang was the first designer to stream and he streamed right. in the er, late late 90s early 2000s maybe like 2001 yeah. and everybody freaked out right it was like the end you know and now everybody does yeah. it 
Everybody but, does but it. But it didn't. And of course, he's a visionary too. He got out. He got and now out. he, he he's lives a in Southampton in and paints. Southampton is the but, most um, wonderful man. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, was a, it was a big deal, and everybody thought it was the end. How could he do that? How could he let everybody enjoy this fashion right. show and this special event? And again, Tom Ford will hold things. You know, Tom Ford. Oh, yeah, does he does it. that. Tom Ford often won't let people into his show. I mean, I've done shows for him where there's just like. A handful of people. Yeah, he did those there. shows where he like I he. I think when and he was he, building his brand again, that he realized he had to. You know, there's pros and cons for it. And I think what your point is, or what my point is, sorry, is that it it has transformed fashion online. You know, it, it's transformed everything. Really, I mean, the whole entire world. In fact, I mean, from music, from fashion, from you know, filmmaking. We all have a shot at doing these things now. You know, but the thing is, what does separate? The kids from the grown-ups really is talent at the mm -hmm. end of the day, mm -hmm. and maybe it's helped for talents that may have been unseen before to become more prevalent. You know, but they'll get wherever you may be. You know, mm -hmm. if you're a really good designer, you're going to get gonna snapped get up by somebody pretty quickly. Anybody then. else? Any more, any more questions? Yes. Well, I think that um, something very exciting that's happening right now is next week, so actually perfect. a week and a half away, the Sewing Academy yeah. opens. It's um, in, in, the NFA in collaboration with Catholic Charities is, what's the first class? Van Tucker, the CEO of the NFA is here today. Is our first class? August 31st. August 31st, the first class has 12 people in it. And we're educating um, a workforce that will go and be able to produce at Omega Industries, which is opening a satellite factory from their main factory in Smithville, that's going to be able to service our local designers by supplying small batch, right. small batch production, which is a big deal. Like the reason, the reason that production is an issue in the U.S. is mainly because designer, smaller design, or for smaller designers, the reason it's an issue for smaller designers is because they can't meet the minimums. Like these big factories right. demand that you order hundreds or thousands of units. And what our designers can really handle right now, and Leslie, you could, you probably yeah. agree with this, you know, you're looking for 20 to 50 units. Right. So we're going to, we're going to create the workforce that's going to be able to supply that for our designers. Did that answer your question? I, I know you said something about transportation. Oh, no, you didn't. Absolutely. Right, right. And that's our, that's our whole I point with the NFA. I think that's what the NFA's yeah. ultimate goal is, and that's ultimately why we're all very excited about the NFA's, because it's a basically... In one sense, a think tank as well mm -hmm. of, of Good point. creative people from all different industries, and sort of combining off like sort of individual talents, but also I must say what Van and Libby what they're trying to do is really create a viable industry. Period. You know, which is business, which is cr job creation. Because without that, if we can't create jobs, then no one's going to get their. You know, what's the point ultimately? But also, if you can't train, mm -hmm. that is a big, big, big part of the puzzle here. Is how to train. And there's an underserved population here that there we is. are. We're we're trying. We're figuring out how to educate so people can. We can give people who haven't been able to get jobs, especially in this sector. We create the jobs for them and train them to do these jobs. Right. So but everybody, I, I need to plug for the NFA. Our membership campaign starts tomorrow. So please go to Nashville Fashion. Alliance.com and become a member of the NFA. There's some wonderful benefits, and um, I expect everybody here to sign up. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't, we'll no, come but, for you. <laughs> our, okay, our chair, the chairman of our board, Matt Edmondson of Imogene and Willie, said that we do the work that makes the glamour possible, right. which is really the message right. that, I, that I was giving earlier, right. which was, you know, you can and have a fashion show, but... these designers didn't start from right. nothing. You know, I mean, they start, they, they've worked hard for a long time. These, in, this, these fashion capitals have become fashion capitals over decades upon decades upon decades, if not over a century plus. Mm -hmm. 
you know? So I think that's the one thing to be mindful of within Nashville is that the music industry didn't just start like that. You know, so to start the fashion industry, we're just planting the baby seeds right now that are going to grow up hopefully one day to be a big old tree that will big be, old tree. you know, but there is a lot of potential and there is a lot of potential for production and manufacturing mm -hmm. and also for the emerging talent that's here. But again, Nashville is going to have its own singular voice within the fashion community. Mm -hmm. And I do see that a lot that is really becoming quite modern though mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Billy Reed, for instance, I mean, I know he's from Alabama, you know, but he's a real presence here in Nashville, but he is also a massive presence in New York City and is mm -hmm. incredibly well respected, you know, and there is global business. There's a lot that um, Nashville has a, an interesting sort of lifestyle component mm -hmm. to it that is really alluring to people because it's it's luxury, yet there's an ease to it as well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is a big market for Nashville, mm -hmm. ultimately, is sort of finding that that fine line between sort of Mm -hmm. fashion Agreed. and and wearability and I think that's for me personally I feel like that's what Nashville's biggest sort of um, industry within fashion could be I agree. and then we can have all the beautiful flamboyant and gorgeous things absolutely because we need that too. should we take what who somebody else had a question this man right here yes thank you Yes. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Um, Stephen Mizell is um, one photographer that comes to mind. I've worked with him, God, since I was 17. I did my first Vogue cover with him on my 18th birthday. That was this crazy shoot. I mean, I don't know if you see his picture. He's going to go back to the Prada. Prada. He took those Prada images. But um, that was a, that these images, it was this crazy shoot that we did. And it really sort of um, made a big impact in the fashion industry. It was sort of a particular set of, a set of pictures that sort of changed everything. And he has been a friend for 20 years plus. I mean, I, I'm 36 now. I still work with him. I did a Vogue, had a cover with him a few months ago. And he's just remarkable. He, there's, there's a, he's the master. He created Naomi Campbell, Christy Turlington, Linda Evangelista. Everybody says, oh, we know when a model's work with Mizell because they know how to move in front of a camera. He, he's like the education, you know I mean? He knows fashion photography, mm -hmm. he knows art, he is the sweetest person as well, and it's never um, torture. You're always done by 6, 6.30, you know? And you've created <laughs> these iconic images, and he's the nicest man, and you have the most incredible supportive team, and he just lays out a scenario where you can play. You know, he always has the right music on for the shoot. He, he, he almost invents a soundtrack, the set, everything, where you just walk in and it's like, okay, if you cannot, you want to give him your best. And Tim Walker is another photographer who I feel the exact same thing for. Oh, God, is, some of the stuff you've done with him blows my I mind. I adore him. I we mean, went to Bhutan oh. for two weeks almost this year and did this incredible story for Vogue that was so rich and sumptuous, and he sort of really evokes... Mm -hmm the sort of Norman Parkinson's of back in the day. I mean, he is an incredible photographer and, um, you know, just speaks volumes. He is an, a wonderful person. I, I develop, you know, I, over the years, you develop a relationship with these people. There's a real interchangeability between the model and the photographer. I mean, there's a real unspoken language of trust that I'll do whatever you want me to do because I love you, you know, and you get me and you see the weirdness in me and you make me look... <laughs> All mm. kinds of, you know, it's not, it's hard work, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people think, oh, I want to be a model and live this sort of glamorous life. I often will, you know, drop the kids off at school, go to the airport, jump on the plane, because there's no direct flights to Europe, have to transfer somewhere, <laughs> you know, and then get off the plane and go straight to work and sometimes work 20 hour days, have a few hours of sleep, do it all over again, have a few hours of sleep and do it all over again, jump on the plane and fly to another place. When you're on set, it's not like you have time to eat half the time. It's not like you're, right. you know, people take care everybody of you, needs you. you've got to be like self-sufficient and really work hard. And that's where the photographer comes in because if they respect you, they create a condition where you don't care working 20 hours. You're having like, you're, you're a part of the team. And that's with the photographers that I work with, they make me feel part of their team, not just sort of a prop, you know, like I'm a part of their creative process. And that's why I've continued modeling for so long is because I am lucky enough to have found my niche in fashion mm -hmm. that is 
really fortunate because it's really, I could count a handful of other models who, like, we have, we, thank God, found our weird mm -hmm. and wonderful mm -hmm. place, and it's each unique to our personalities right. and the way we look. And I love it still, you know? I mean, I love the, the, the process of it. I love photography. I absolutely love photography. So it's always inspiring to be in front of a great photographer's lens, basically. Let's just do one more. Oh, one more. Sure. Does anybody have a question? Somebody does. Somebody has a question. <laughs> one more? No? Yay! Oh. <laughs> great question. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, I do think about those things, to be honest, because there is a um, something to be said that getting materials from a certain place, or just having each fashion city being a bubble, an entity onto itself. I mean, I do, um, I do think that the sort of globalization of fashion, it's really brilliant. But at the same oh, time, oh, it's opened up fashion. It's, it's opened allowed up fashion. access to well, so many other ideas. I will ideas say, if you want to, you know, you have to really, if you want to do something more exclusive, you really just have to be bespoke at this point. You know, I mean, you have to, you just have to. That has to be your business statement. Is that's where you're going to go because it's all up for grabs at this point. But that said, it's not really. I mean, only fashion insiders, only a good designer knows who's got the best kind of fabrics, and they work with fabric textile manufacturers mm -hmm. to create their own textiles. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, the people on the A-list of fashion, they've got resources that aren't really readily available to anybody else. So right. I don't worry about that per se. And what, I don't think they're worrying about that, you know? But I do think in the mid-tier fashion market, it's probably a brilliant thing because they have access to get mm -hmm. incredible fabrics, materials, mm -hmm. tools, and resources now much more easily than you could say 10, 15 years ago. But I, I will say that, and this, I think that this is answering a little bit of your question, but it's also going back to your question about the internet. It's like when, when people started showing online, they were like, oh, but you can't because then people will see the designs and they'll knock them off quicker. Right. But that was an issue in the 50s in Paris. Right. You know, they right. used to lock, they wouldn't let you sketch during shows because they knew that the knockoff artists were going right. to start creating patterns at but that point. But everyone can sell knock and everything off. And then you yeah, look absolutely. in H&M, and you look in Topshop, and you look in Zara, and it's all like, you know, yeah. cheaper fabrics, kind of a little different cut. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, you see that, but then you go into an amazing vintage store, and you'll see a dress that is... Exactly, you know, the like, dress that you're like, oh, that's a Prada dress. That's yeah, a Prada. yeah. Like, or that's know, I used a... to go to a vintage store in London called Virginia's. It's so sad that it's closed. And I know she's still around, and she just does things from her. I mean, she lives in like the most beautiful home ever. But I would go there, and you'd bump into John Galliano, or you'd mm -hmm. bump into somebody from Versace's team, you know. And they would go because it was a specific, the bias cut, you know, the beautiful cut dresses that. While you can train someone to do that, it's still very different. You know, it's still, you see how it hangs, how the fabric hangs, and mm -hmm. they would go and get those dresses and basically use that as the sort of the model, the prototype for what the dress would actually there be. There's this article in the New York Times today about Morphe, which is a vintage source in mm -hmm. New York, and how sometimes designers just go in and like they will take a garment and just forget making a muslin of it, they'll send it to China and have right. it remade. Right. You know, just because it's, yeah. I know. Yeah. It's like, wow, I cannot believe that they said that in the article. But anyway, <laughs> it's you really know, shocking. <laughs> I, I mean, I will not name names, but I've definitely, you know, mm -hmm. I've seen designers basically in fittings sketch like, oh, we like that, you know, mm -hmm. this dress. Or I remember one time there was this artist and they took the, the drawings and put it onto the shoes and then put it onto the dresses. And mm -hmm. I remember the designer saying, do you think we should credit the artist and the editor was like, oh, don't worry, don't oh. worry, it's fine. Everybody rips everybody off at this, a certain point. It's just the way the world works, you know? Like, what is originality? You know, it's just what you're, it, it, originality is a wonderful thing, and these designers are incredibly original, but everybody's influenced by some, somebody, mm -hmm. even them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just how you interpret it into something new. All right, well, I think that's a good place to end. Thank you all Thank so you. much. <laughs>
And be sure to check out the exhibition. Yes, the exhibition is And join amazing. the NFA.